All right, welcome everyone to the Kentucky Academy of Science annual meeting. Today is our first keynote day, this Friday at just a tad over 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. We are very excited to have with us Dr. Burton Webb, who is the president of the University of Pikeville. And from my understanding, Dr. Webb, uh, education has been a big, a big and important part of his life throughout his career. In his undergraduate, he studied zoology and chemistry, for his master's degree, he got a master's in biology from Ball State, PhD in microbiology and immunology from Indiana School of Medicine. And uh, on a personal note, I've seen some of his lectures online, and uh, he, I think he's done a really good job of explaining how vaccines work in a way that uh, everybody can understand. And that's one of the reasons we invited him here is because I think, you know, I think everybody, especially in the science world, has a... Uh, you know, is interested in learning more about that from a scientific perspective. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Burton Webb. I'll stop my share and let you take over. Well, thanks, everybody. It's, it's great to be here with you and have an opportunity to speak to this group uh, today. Um, I have to warn you, first of all, that I am no longer a practicing scientist. I haven't published a scientific paper in several years now. Because uh, about a decade ago, maybe a little longer, I made the transition to the dark side of the university and uh, started off as a department chair and then moved into the dean's office and then the, the provost office. And now here I sit uh, as the president of the university. So uh, if you'll bear with me, my training is in uh, medical immunology and microbiology. And I want to talk just a little bit about the coronavirus and a little bit about its life cycle. And then we'll jump into the immunology and I'll talk a little bit about vaccines, how they work and why they work, and then um, some different content on why it's still critically important to get vaccinated, even if you've had COVID. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we think right now is the best uh, combination of immunity and uh, then wrap up by talking just a little bit about how the pandemic ends. So let me share my screen and we'll jump into this uh, content. So. All right. I think with that, you should be able to see uh, the, the presentation. I know that uh, some of you in the in the Zoom room are going to be saying, well, why in the world aren't you on full screen present? And that's because I tried that a little while ago and it just doesn't work for some reason uh, from this device in this context. So uh, let's just talk a little bit about uh, the, the COVID um, outbreak that we have caused by SARS-CoV-2. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus and we'll talk about those in just a minute. Then I'll spend some time with vaccinations and talk about the end of the pandemic. But before I get to that, I want to point something out. You know, in, in the media, we often treat um, emerging diseases as if this is the first pandemic we've ever seen. Or if, uh, if the media is being really generous, they'll talk a little bit about the flu pandemic back in uh, 1917, 1918. And, and really, I want to point out that these pandemics come along all the time. Uh, this is a figure lifted from a book that was published sometime uh, last year called Apollo's Arrow. And uh, it, it really illustrates quite nicely, I think, just how frequent pandemics are. And, and for those of you who aren't biologists or don't come from a microbiology background, a pandemic is an epidemic that has a worldwide scope. So we get local epidemics all the time, but pandemics really have a much broader scope than that. And you can see on this that we've been recording in, in literature pandemics since the early part of the 18th century. And there's a relatively common frequency with which they happen. They tend to happen every 30 or 40 years or so. And in fact, the pandemic that we're seeing now has a much longer uh, lag phase or a much longer gap between this and the last pandemic in 77, 79. The pandemics you're seeing on the screen are of a variety of different kinds. Of course, some of them are bacterial. Yersinia pestis, which causes the Black Plague, is one of these pandemics. Uh, we've got measles pandemics and flu pandemics and a variety of things illustrated here. This just, just gives you that idea that pandemics have been around for a very, very long time. So let's talk about the current one. Uh, this is a, an image, surprisingly enough, from Wikipedia that is a, a nice uh, space-filling electron micrograph of what a coronavirus looks like. Uh, coronaviruses for the microbiologists in the crowd are their positive sense, single-stranded RNA, enveloped RNA viruses. Uh, 
And, and though that's a mouthful from um, the point of view of a microbiologist or an immunologist, that actually tells us an awful lot about how this virus is going to, to survive in its environment and also how it's going to interact with the immune system. So when we say it's a positive sense RNA virus, that means that the piece of RNA contained inside this virus can be transcribed immediately into protein, right? It also means that this virus has to carry with it a, an enzyme that can copy that positive sense RNA into negative sense RNA so that the virus can replicate itself. That's really important in this context because if there's a viral RNA transcriptase involved in the replication, that means that the virus has a mutation rate that's higher than most DNA sequences. RNA polymerases tend to have very high mutation rates. And so we're going to see the emergence of new strains and new subtypes of coronaviruses because of that enzyme. The envelope is critically important too because envelopes, uh, envelope viruses don't survive well in the environment for very long periods of time. They might live on a surface for several hours, uh, very rarely, and if the surface has a lot of moisture on it, they might last for a little bit longer than that. But these viruses just don't hang around on surfaces, and they're very sensitive to ultraviolet light. If this were a naked virus, like many of the viruses that cause the common cold, we would have all sorts of problems uh, with this virus just sitting around in the environment for days and weeks on end. Thankfully, it's an envelope virus. Uh, it has a variety of, of proteins that extrude from the surface, and here you're looking at several structural proteins that they've coated and colored in different ways. That large protein that is uh, gold and blue color that's sticking out from the surface of, of the virus uh, is the spike protein. And the spike protein is something that I talked about in, in the vaccination video, and I'll come back to here in a little bit. Uh, that spike protein is absolutely essential for the attachment phase of this virus's life cycle. So far uh, in coronaviruses, there are at least 45 recognized species of these viruses. The vast majority of them cause the common cold. So these are upper respiratory tract viruses for the most part. A few of them are, are lower respiratory tract viruses and can cause pneumonia, but most of them are fairly mild in the diseases that they cause. Um, there are a few exceptions though, and, and the exceptions really start uh, in, in the 21st century when we see the emergence of SARS and MERS, uh, both of those emerging from uh, Asian population, uh, China or, or in the Koreas. And we see the emergence of these, um, these two viruses. Uh, these, these were both coronaviruses, both very, very similar uh, to the one that causes COVID-19 with at least one exception. And that exception was, was a pretty important one. Both SARS and MERS had a much higher case fatality rate than COVID-19. And it turns out that that is actually what protects us. Um, because SARS and MERS had such a high fatality rate, first, they were noticed quickly. Uh, the patients were isolated and quarantined fairly quickly. And the patients who got sick got desperately sick and didn't live long enough to spread the disease very widely. So SARS and MERS were, in a sense, failed attempts of coronavirus to trigger a pandemic. Uh, and then along came uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is very closely related to the, the virus that caused SARS, uh, but it's the second strain, second subtype, and that's the one that causes uh, the disease we now recognize as COVID-19. This is, uh, from a viral point of view, a fairly large genome. Uh, it's a large single-stranded piece of RNA that we see inside this virus. So, so that's what the virus looks like. Let's take a quick look at the viral life cycle, uh, because the viral life cycle will give us information in a few minutes about how the body fights this disease. Uh, so, so this is a, a, a picture, and I, I posted the link there, uh, the location where I, I got this diagram from. It's a pretty standard, straightforward replication uh, process for enveloped positive strand RNA viruses. So you see up there at the top, and I'm going to try to touch this with my, uh, my stylus. I guess you can't really see me highlighting anything on the screen. Um, at the top in the upper left-hand corner of the screen is a picture of the virus. You can see... Uh, there are spike proteins up there, and on the surface of the virus, they're shaped a bit like pinchers. And then next to that, there is a sort of stem and bulb um, that's there, and you can see on that, that that's the uh, fusion protein. Uh, and then inside, you've got a, a copy of the RNA. You see the, the double membrane wall that exists right around the, the structure of the virus. 
That's what we mean when we say it's enveloped. It has a membrane around it. Well, right away, you can see that those spike proteins are attaching to something. Um, because this is a generic coronavirus life cycle and not the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2, they don't have these things labeled. But in the case of COVID, that would be the spike protein on the surface of the virus and the ACE2 receptor on the surface of the cell. I'll show you in just a couple of minutes where the ACE2 receptor is expressed so you can get an idea of what symptoms we might see emerging uh, from an infection with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but we'll come back to that in just a second. So the first step, the virus gains entry into the cell. It's still a little bit unclear whether it's a membrane fusion or an endocytic activity that draws this virus in. In either case, the virus gets in and the RNA escapes from that nuclear capsid and makes its way into the cytoplasm of the cell. Uh, since this is a positive sense RNA virus, that RNA can be immediately transcribed into protein. And, and that's an important step in this virus's life cycle because one of the first proteins that it must transcribe is a viral RNA polymerase. Now, RNA polymerases do what you would expect if you're a biologist. They're going to copy RNA into another copy of RNA. In addition to RNA polymerase being made, you also have ribosomes that will attach uh, from the cell directly to this RNA, and they'll start transcribing the proteins of the virus. But the RNA polymerase will copy it into a negative strand of the RNA um, from the virus, which then gets copied again into the plus strand and can be continually replicated into proteins. So that's all part of the life cycle. Some of this RNA will carry leader sequences, which will allow it to be carried to the endoplasmic reticulum. You're seeing that there. Uh, a little bit further down in the diagram, and those viruses will be either inserted into the membrane in the endoplasmic reticulum or, or captured out on the, the cytoplasmic side or the interior uh, location of the ER so that we can package this virus appropriately. And then it goes right through the default pathway that you would expect to see from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus to a secretory vesicle, and then it's, it's secreted out into circulation as an intact whole virus. Uh, so, so the life cycle is really important for a variety of reasons. First of all, um, if we can do anything to block the binding of the virus to the ACE2 receptor, that will block the ability of the virus to gain access to the cell and block everything else in the life cycle from that point. So from an immunologic point of view, our goal is to block entry into the cell. Now, if we've got someone who, who shows up at the, at the hospital and they've already been infected, well, blocking entry into the cell is still useful, but perhaps it might not be enough. So what we need to do at that point is try to attack uh, some of the proteins that are enzymatic proteins uh, that are specific to the virus. And the best target we see is right there up front. It's the viral pol polymerase. If we can identify drugs that attach and bind to viral polymerases selectively more tightly than they would bind to DNA or RNA polymerase from our own cells, then that would be a great target for a drug. And I think I've read of at least one, uh, one medication that's been approved that does in fact bind to RNA polymerase. So it would slow down the replication of SARS-CoV-2 and, and probably have a, a positive effect on patients. So blocking entry is critically important. But there are other mechanisms that the immune response has to fight viral infections other than blocking entry. So we'll talk a little bit about those two when we get to the immunology section. Of course, the problem here is, with, with this virus in particular, uh, is that there is um, a period of time during which the patient is asymptomatic. And you can see on the right-hand side there, uh, we've got a diagram that says, asymptomatic and symptomatic, those are time periods. And then a period where the virus is latent, the virus is in your body, it's replicating, but it's not being secreted yet from the body. And then when you're symptomatic, of course, the virus is being secreted, but that spot in the orange is, is what we call a mismatch period. And it is in the mismatch period when a patient is still asymptomatic uh, for 24 to 48 hours usually, but it can be shorter or a longer duration than that. Uh, during which a patient is highly contagious. They can pass this virus from one person to another person, uh, but they're not yet symptomatic. So this is why in the early days of the COVID-19 outbreak, we'd have someone show up with symptoms, 
They'd go get tested, they'd be positive, and we would ask, so who are your contacts for the last 48 hours? Because we had to go back and get those contacts and say, we think that you may have been exposed. You could be in a latent asymptomatic period yourself. We want you to quarantine so that we don't continue to spread this virus uh, throughout the population. Of course, we all know now that that didn't work very well, even though um, it works quite well, and at least theoretically, and if we can get people to comply, uh, we can slow down and stop the spread of viruses and bacteria through quarantine and isolation. That's been done for a long time. Um, but when we live in a society in a country where people don't want to comply with quarantine orders, well, then it doesn't work. And that should come as a surprise to no one. So it is that mismatch period that creates uh, the problems that we see. Um, from an immunologic point of view and, and also from uh, a disease point of view, uh, this, this is a really interesting virus. Um, first of all, from an immunologic point of view, envelope viruses can be really tricky uh, for the immune system to handle. You know, these viruses um, carry a part of the cell membrane of the cell that they just infected. Now, sometimes they carry almost entirely viral proteins on that cell membrane, but they can pick up host proteins too. And if they pick up host proteins, then that can be difficult for the immune system uh, to identify and specifically remove the virus. So it, it's not impossible, it just makes it tricky. And so these viruses are notoriously difficult uh, to, to mount good immune responses and especially good memory responses to. Um, the RNA viruses as a group have a higher mutation rate, but especially those uh, with a positive sense RNA that, that absolutely require a viral uh, transcriptase. We've talked about that already. That, that high mutation rate means that we're going to see the emergence of a variety of strains and types of the virus uh, that, that can be problematic in the society and the population. The second thing that we need to think about here is you know, what sorts of cells in the body are capable of being infected by SARS-CoV-2? Because that's going to tell us what the symptoms might look like, and it'll also tell us a little something about how the immune response will, will handle things. Well, again, this is a diagram uh, that I put a link to so you can see the source down there. Um, but take a look at all of the different organ sites, the ones illustrated in green that are, that have ACE2 receptors on them that are widely distributed and often have a very high density. It'll come as a surprise to no one that the nasopharyngea is, is one of those sources where ACE2 is very high. But then if you look around the body, you've got a variety of places that you might not suspect. So in the eye, we have a high, <coughs> high percentage of ACE2 receptors. On the tongue, the taste buds, uh, the cells that, that transduce that, that biochemical signal of taste into a, a neurochemical signal also have high levels of ACE2. In the brain, you've got ACE2. In the heart, in the stomach, in parts of the digestive tract, in the reproductive tract, in the urinary tract, you've got ACE2. Uh, so really, the only places where we don't see a whole lot of it are in the bone and in, in the lymphatics themselves. We don't see a lot of ACE2 so just about everywhere else, we see ACE2, which means that SARS-CoV-2, though it, it has a certain, um, it, it has a rapid access to the nasopharyngea and the respiratory system and the oropharyngea, it can, if the virus gets elsewhere, it can infect a wide variety of other cells. And so we get an awful lot of really diverse symptoms as a result of that. So when you hear someone who's lost the sense of taste and smell, well, the virus has infected those cells that are responsible for signal transduction in taking those, those chemical signals uh, of smell and taste and turning them into neurologic signals. And so you lose the ability to taste and smell. My sister had COVID and I, I ran into her just a few weeks ago and she said that things taste strange now. So she used to taste some things as spicy and now they're sour. And her body is just beginning to relearn what tastes and smells are like. And uh, so we can expect to see those kinds of, of things for a long time, which gets us to why we vaccinate. We really vaccinate for two reasons. Um, first of all, we vaccinate to prevent severe disease, and I'll get in, into that in just a minute. But then the second reason we vaccinate is to prevent disease sequela. 
And uh, that word is probably exactly what you would think. If you go to the movies and the movie doesn't quite end and there's a sequel, the rest of the story is in the sequel. And that is exactly what we see here. Um, I, I did this for a couple of different diseases, just so you can see that sequelae are fairly common. Um, one of the diseases that has been eradicated from the planet now is smallpox. And smallpox had um, some pretty serious long-term sequelae. So one, if you survived smallpox, made it through to the other side, the most common sequela was pockmarks and severe scarring on the skin. I remember being in my, um, my art history class when I was an undergraduate, and uh, the professor was talking about the paintings from the 17th and 18th centuries. And he said, of course, these people didn't really look like this. And we also, well, what do you mean? I mean, the artist is supposed to try to capture what people look like. Said, oh no, these people, most of them had smallpox at some point, and their skin was just covered by these bumps that were really disfiguring. And and you didn't think about that, but in fact, that's probably the case. The artist edited out all of the pox from smallpox. At a at a much lower rate, um, people still experience, would experience blindness, encephalitis, osteomyelitis. If a woman was infected with small, the smallpox virus while pregnant, it could frequently result in stillbirth. Uh, the child would simply not, not be a live birth. And, and very rarely um, in men, a smallpox infection would lead, lead to male infertility because the smallpox virus actually infects the testis. So those kinds of sequelae uh, drove us to first isolating, isolation and quarantine, but then once uh, it was determined that, that vaccines were available, Edward Jenner and his work around that, um, smallpox was brought under control because of the vaccine. And so people took that vaccine to prevent the disease, but more importantly, to prevent the sequela. So here we see um, a, a recent study that was published, and this is uh, some of just a little bit of data that I've, I've lifted into this, um, looking at the six month out sequela of SARS-CoV-2. And you can see that there are a variety of things here the most common of which are fatigue, trouble breathing, and a persistent and long-lasting cough, especially in people who had severe disease. So those sequelae can last for months. Uh, I have friends now who are a year out from COVID infection, several of them hospital, hospitalized, and they're telling me that brain fog is still a serious problem even a year later. So we've got to pay attention to certainly to the illness, the morbidity, the mortality associated with SARS-CoV-2, because those are real and they're significant and important. But what we, we really need to watch for is all these long-term sequelae, because we don't really know yet uh, what those will be and how long they will last. And I put smallpox up here, but I could just have easily have, have used measles. And of course, the scary thing about measles is not the disease and certainly not the short-term sequela, but one of the long-term sequela for measles is subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. And trust me, nobody wants that. You don't want ulcers and lesions forming on your brain 20 years later. Now, we don't see anything like that with, with SARS-CoV-2 at this point, but again, it's a relatively new virus and we don't really know exactly what it's doing. All right, so I wanna jump now into the immunology of this disease and. I don't have any idea if I'm still on camera, but I'm pretty sure the presentation is still working. So I'm gonna switch here so I can actually write on my screen and hopefully this will work and I don't drop anything. So let's see here. I'm assuming everybody can see the screen. I hope that's the case. Uh, you won't be able to see my face. You'll see the, the ceiling in the room. All right, so the immunology of this is really interesting. And what we're trying to do, of course, is we're trying to mount an immune response against this virus. And this is just a really rough drawing of the envelope virus. Um, and uh, so let's see here. I've got to find all my tools. They keep getting hid behind the text. Um, that's really interesting. The closed captioning is hiding uh, my toolbar. <laughs> uh, so uh, this, this is the virus. And, and what we're trying to do is, is mount a, a response against these spike proteins. So this is a spike protein here. And uh, if we can mount an immune response to that, here's a cell membrane, and here's an ACE2 receptor on the surface of that cell membrane. What we wanna do is prevent this interaction. And the way that we do that is by uh, 
vaccinating against the spike protein so that the body will mount an immune response and form antibodies. All right, antibody is a Y-shaped molecule and I, I label that AB. Well, if you've watched the other video, you know that this takes time. So if we, if we look at this over the course of time, uh, you get infected with something down here at time, not, at time zero, and then it, there's a bit of a lag phase, and this lag phase is when the virus is incubating in your body. And then after a, a period of time, seven to 10 days, usually, you'll start to see a little bit of an immune response that looks like this. This immune response is dominated by a particular kind of antibody called IgM. Uh, IgM is a, a pentavalent antibody. It can actually attach to uh, about 10 different viruses all at one time if they'll fit in a stoichiometric way. Uh, but it can do that. So this is the first antibody that comes up, and then it, it begins to decline after a couple of weeks. Um, so this is the normal course of infection. Now, the reason we want to vaccinate is if we vaccinate some, someone, they'll still mount this immune response, but down here in, in a normal timeline of disease, you might see uh, that this is the latent period here, and then sometime over here, you start to get symptoms. So the symptoms are here, and the symptoms can be really severe. In fact, if, if you have a really severe case of SARS-CoV-2, you could die during this symptomatic phase even while your body is mounting an immune response. And the reason for that is the, the body is mounting an immune response. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, there was a pop-up note at the top of my screen. I had to pause to read that. Um, the, the body is mounting an immune response, but it could be that the virus has enough of a head start that it's going to take you first. Or in some people, their immune response is so overwhelming that it triggers a negative response in the body and can result in a, a systematic inflammatory response that just wipes them out. So, so we vaccinate to prevent that. We vaccinate because we can stimulate the immune response without the disease. Right, so the second time you see something, if it's the same, uh, the same virus, uh, we're gonna see something over here, secondary infection. And the secondary infection, you get massive immune response and the antibody concentration tapers over time. Uh, this one is predominantly IgG. IgG is great at protecting the blood, doesn't work so well on mucosal surfaces. Uh, there should be a, a little tiny peak of IgA in here, um, somewhere in, in here that is protective of mucosal surfaces, okay? All right, so I need to erase this. So I'm gonna get up here and do this. So, so again, this is why we vaccinate. We want to get a head start on the disease and on the symptoms of the disease. Well, what does that mean in terms of, of the immune response over here? Come on, little screen. Get off there. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so over here, we're, this is the antibody that we talk about. So this is IgM in the primary response or... IgG in the secondary response. And the whole idea is to physically block all of these spike proteins. If we do that, then the virus can't gain access into the cell. Because viruses are obligated to be inside the cell to replicate, they can't cause disease. Now, we find that, I find this personally really fascinating um, because right now there is a group that in, uh, I believe it's in the Soviet Union, that is looking at a very small population over there that is absolutely incapable of being infected with SARS-CoV-2. They have been exposed repeatedly. They have never, they've developed antibody titer, but they've never developed an infection. And they're trying to figure out what's going on with them. Uh, what they think, at least in the early stages of this work, they think that these people have a mutation in ACE2 that prevents SARS-CoV-2 from binding. Now that's fascinating. Um, but it underscores the fact that SARS-CoV-2 absolutely must bind. It is an obligate intracellular parasite. Okay, so that's why it's important uh, for us to get vaccinated and a little bit about how the vaccine actually functions. As I erase the rest of this, I want to talk a little bit more about why it's important to get vaccinated even if you've had uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. So you will remember that if we look at the surface of this virus, you know, we've got all these spike proteins that look like this and, and they cover the surface of this, but that's not the only thing here. There are actually four structural proteins here. 
So we have a protein that mediates membrane fusion that looks like this. Uh, we, have, we have some proteins under the surface of the membrane here that are part of the structure. And then there's at least one other protein that protrudes through. We think it's a pore-like protein. So I'm not even sure how to draw that. Just something like that. I'll just put a couple of them on. All right. So right now, um, the, the major vaccines that are out there are RNA-based vaccines uh, that code for this protein right here. So the spike protein. All right. Now, because of the way the FDA works, when you, when you submit a vaccine, you have to submit a vaccine that is just as it will be when you put it into the population. So the sequence of this spike protein is set. Uh, it doesn't vary. All of the Moderna uh, spike proteins have the same sequence. They have the exact same structure. All of the Pfizer's have the exact same sequence and same structure. Uh, and, and so it's, it's very, very clear what the sequence and structure is. But remember what I said about coronaviruses. They mutate at a really high rate. Uh, so this spike protein is changing. And what we've seen already is the emergence of another, another variant, the Delta variant, uh, which has a higher infectivity rate, presumably because there are minor changes in the spike protein or, or some other structure here that cause it to have a, a much higher infection rate than, than the original SARS-CoV-2. In fact, uh, there is another variant running around. Actually, there are a whole bunch of them. Uh, there's the Lambda variant that's running around right now and some indication is that the spike protein has changed enough that the vaccine is much less effective than in these. So it, it's got decreased effectiveness. Now, thankfully, it's still somewhat effective, but it seems to be much less. And uh, we're, we're running out of Greek letters, actually, now to name all of these viruses. All right. So um, the great thing about the vaccine is so far, the spike protein is stable enough that it's protective. So it's important to get vaccinated. Uh, with, with Pfizer, Moderna, or J&J, &J because they carry this. Um, but that's also the Achilles heel of this vaccine, because Lambda, Gamma, Epsilon, all the other variants that are starting to come out, many of them may have a different spike protein, in which case uh, the vaccine will have reduced efficacy. So it's important to get it, but it's not, not maybe the panacea that we hope it might be if this virus continues to, met, to, to mutate. So if you've already had um, COVID-19, should you get the vaccine? That's a great question. That, that's the question that I got a lot after releasing that last video. Uh, the answer is yes. And, and the reason for that has to do with the way the immune response works. So uh, I keep losing my pen here because I bump it with my hand. Come on. One more time. If I keep talking, then the closed captioning resets and I can touch the pen. All right. So, so the immune system, it actually operates under an amplification model with the, the B cells that make antibody. So ABCD, these are four different B cells. These each have the, the ability to produce only one kind of antibody. And when the virus gets in, one of them will become dominant. So this becomes the, the immunodominant um, viral or an immune response. So if you get SARS-CoV-2, you could have an immunodominant immune response against the spike protein, but what if you actually have it against this other membrane protein and you're not mounting a very strong immune response against spike? Well, then the chances are you're going to have one of those breakthrough infections because you can still, this virus can still bind by a spike protein to the ACE2 receptor. So breakthrough infections for someone who's already had this I mean, that, that's very real and it could happen. So, so what we want to do is we want to we stimulate as strong a possible immune response against the spike protein, and that's what the vaccine is capable of doing. Okay, so great. We've, we've taken the vaccine. We've got a, a great immune response to the spike protein. Now the virus changes, and the spike protein is no longer the protective uh, structure that it once was. Well, now what? Well, this is why people who've been vaccinated and subsequently infected with the virus actually have the best immunity against the virus. Because if you've been vaccinated two times, Pfizer, Moderna, or one time with J&J, &J, you've been vaccinated and then you get the virus, you'll be, in, you'll be protected from severe infection.
there are so few people who end up on respirators who've been vaccinated. It, it's a minuscule amount. And the people who are have an underlying condition or are over the age of 75 almost always. Not, a, not always, but almost always they're, they're in that group. So they probably didn't mount a great immune response to the vaccine in the first place. All right. So, so with this, if, if you've had the vaccine, you're protected from severe disease, you get the virus, then your immune response is going to start selecting on some of these other proteins and mounting an immune response against those. Well, that's great because if the spike protein changes, chances are that all these other proteins won't be changed as well. And so you'll still have protective immunity against other strains that might emerge later. And that's a really good thing, all right? That will protect you from, from subsequent infections with other things. And uh, this, is, this story is kind of in, an interesting one to me because I had uh, the Pfizer vaccine. I had the second shot from the Pfizer vaccine. And uh, after about six months, we had the opportunity to go get boosted a third time. And I thought, well, you know, I kind of want to know what my antibody concentration is before I go do that. So I went uh, and had my, my blood drawn to have my antibody titer tested. And I said, I want the spike protein tested. And I also want to know the rest of those nucleocapsid proteins. Have I mounted any immune response to those? Well, my number got called and I went and got my booster. And then my results came back in two days later. And guess what I found out? I've been vaccinated two times and I had antibodies against the rest of the nucleocapsid protein. What that means is very straightforward. Uh, I had been vaccinated, boosted, and subsequently contracted COVID, and I was completely asymptomatic. I had absolutely no idea that I had been infected with anything. And what's more, when my wife's antibody titer came back, she had never been infected with the COVID virus. So I had been vaccinated, boosted, been infected with COVID, but never replicated enough virus that I shed it at sufficient quantities to affect the woman who sleeps next to me every night. That's protection. And that's what your immune response is supposed to do. And the way in which you're, if you take the vaccine and do the things that, that are being suggested, uh, that you can protect the people around you from infection. And, and I think that's a pretty cool thing, which is one of the many reasons that I love immunology. All right, switching screens again, and I'll probably have to log back in. because I've got a few more things to say. Dr. Webb, this is absolutely fascinating. You wanted a, me to give you a 30 minute warning. It's been about uh, 40 or so, but uh, <laughs> you, you keep, keep going as, as, as long as you want. I think we're good. We, I think everybody's really interested. We have a few questions. Uh, if you have time that. Uh, I do. And, and just, I'm going to just wrap this up really, really rapidly here. Um, there are several things that seem to be important in uh, in the between the host and the virus in terms of susceptibility uh, that we still haven't gotten to the bottom of. And I think these are great things for, for folks on the audience or others to do research on. And um, there's some host susceptibility things. Uh, blood type seems to play an important role here. And that could have something to do with H2 receptor expression uh, on the surface of those cells. Um, biologic sex. Um, there is a difference between men and women in the severity of this disease. Not, I mean, both men and women can get severe disease and die but there are differences in the rate. Um, all of the underlying conditions that are involved here are fascinating in the way that they increase susceptibility. There is a variation in ACE2 receptor expression on the surface of folks, and I think that bears, um, you know, bears study. But then finally, um, the way the host responds immunologically seems to be really important. Some people who get serious disease experience an immunologic syndrome called cytokine storm in which the body is responding in a systemic way to what the body sees as a system-wide onslaught of this disease. And that is a, a really overblown kind of thing. It, it would be akin to, you know, someone, uh, you know, pulling a gun on someone else. And instead of just trying to defend themselves, maybe with another gun, uh, they, they pull out a bazooka and they shoot back with a bazooka. So this is the immune response going way overboard, way, way, way more than it. And then, of course, there are viral things, too, that are involved in, in this interaction. And it is this interplay between host and virus that I think we will find extraordinarily fascinating as time goes by uh, with this. So the last thing I want to talk about is, is how the pandemic ends, because I think this is interesting, too. Um, most pandemics have ended with herd immunity. 
Um, and herd immunity can be brought about either by vaccination or by exposure to the disease. Herd immunity is that theoretical percentage at which the population becomes extraordinarily difficult to propagate an infection because so many people are immune. That number changes for every variant of this virus. Um, for the Delta variant, I think it's, it's in the, the mid to upper 70, low 80% range. For the original virus, it's about 63%. Uh, so it keeps changing. It's a bit of a moving target. Um, public health measures will also bring about the end of this. In fact, if you look at pandemics throughout time, public health measures have done more than vaccinations and antibiotics. Um, the other thing that's really good is uh, viruses, especially viruses like this, uh, their goal from an evolutionary point of view is to be endemic in the society for a long time. And the best way to do that is to not cause severe disease. If you're killing your host, you're going to have a hard time maintaining yourself in the population. So viruses, as a rule, tend to weaken over time. So it's very likely that, that some of the coronaviruses that caused the common cold today were pandemics 200 years ago that gradually got less virulent over time. So it's, it's equally likely that the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus will become less virulent over time, and then we will adapt and we'll learn to live with it. And we'll just we'll figure out, you know, we're just going to have to move on and um, and live with this virus and hopefully get enough herd immunity that the serious forms of disease and death uh, are, are not occurring at a very high rate. All right, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing content and then uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, thank you, Dr. Webb. That was absolutely fascinating. I, I think us as a group of scientists and students who you know, just appreciate science anyway, and who've had to deal with this for the past year and a half plus, you know, something that everyone's interested in, whether you want to be or not. So I do have a couple of questions here. I'm sure others will roll in and, and somebody just, just send me others if we have them from YouTube or anyplace else. One question is, assuming that we're fully vaccinated six plus months ago, how long should somebody wait if they've had, if they had a recent case of asymptomatic COVID before getting the booster? I think CDC's recommendation right now is about 90 days, and uh, that's, that's probably fine. Um, you really wanna wait until most of the virus is out of circulation because that allows the immune, the cells that, that um, drive the immune system to, to become a bit more quiescent. You, you want them to come back down because otherwise, all you're gonna do is eliminate that vaccine from circulation really fast. What you want to do is stimulate uh, the memory cells that are found in the periphery. And once those memory cells get stimulated, they'll actually differentiate it to higher affinity cells that can bind to the virus more effectively. And they'll shift from IgG and IgM to IgA, which protects the mucosal surfaces. And that will protect you from being able to be infected in the future. So that's why we wait. We want to stimulate memory immunity rather than just allowing the antibody that's hanging around in the system uh, from an infection to just clear that vaccine really fast. Yeah, I, I was fascinated with your story about you being fully vaccinated and then getting an asymptomatic case and then being boosted. I, similar with me, you know, I, I had a similar situation with that. So I was, I was kind of curious. Uh, another question is when somebody is getting tested for antibodies, what, as someone who's not in the medical field, what would we be looking for in that test specifically? So there are a couple of different tests for antibodies. Um, the, the one that is being used by most clinicians to see the efficacy of the vaccine is looking for anti-spike proteins. And there are two of those tests. One looks for IgM, which means that you've had a recent infection and the other one, or a recent vaccine. And the other one looks for IgG, which means that you've had that second booster and you've got that nice big peak. The second thing that they look for is nucleocapsid proteins, and those are the other proteins that are found on the surface of the virus. So if the nucleocapsid proteins are present, the antibodies against nucleocapsid proteins, that means that you've had an infection um, and, and the vaccine is not being measured in those. Excellent. Valerie, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Feel free to. <clears throat> Dr. Webb, you mentioned that we don't exactly know if the virus getting into the cell is a membrane fusion process or an endocytic process. 
Is there any real consequence to that difference? Do we already have any drugs that might block one of those processes or the other? I, I know as academics, we like to know the details, but I was just wondering if there was any, um, any real consequence to, to knowing the difference in that mechanism. You know, the mechanisms are different and, and there are some things that can block um, endocytosis that won't block membrane fusion. Um, I'm not sure that they're clinically viable uh, simply because of the other side effects. You know, um, endocytosis is a normal process and blocking it in a whole human is a real issue. Yes. The reason be. that I think it's academically interesting, though, is because if it is membrane fusion, then you're leaving spike proteins out on the surface of the cell that's been infected, which uh, would make it a target for the immune system. So that, to me, uh, changes the game. And uh, if, if you're seeing the accumulation of viral spike proteins on the external surface of the cell, well, then antibody-mediated um, uh, T8 cell attack and other kinds of attack would be prevalent. And that could be the case, you know, that could be some of what's going on in, in some of the sequelae that we see. Right. You know, some and of the there brain are some fog people that the think that that's, uh, there are some people that think that that's what vaccine side effects are responding to, is if you have spike be. protein that are in the cell surface membrane. Yeah. The, the nice thing about the RNA virus or the RNA vaccine, though, is it's really unstable inside the cell. So it's, it's only expressed for a short period of time. You're not going to have it hanging around for months. Dirk has a question. Dirk, would you like to ask? I'll go ahead and ask it. I guess he's uh, not, not available to talk right now. You, you hit on this earlier, but uh, a Dirk group asked, what vaccination rate do we need to stop the pandemic? And how can we get those who refuse to be vaccinated, vaccinated? <laughs> Sorry, I had my microphone up, then it is muted. Yeah, but thank you, Terrence. <laughs> so it's, it's no really problem. a combination, uh, Dirk, between vaccination and people who've actually had COVID. And it depends on the strain. Um, so for the original strain, it was between 63 and 65 percent was going to give us herd immunity. But Delta is more contagious. So uh, the latest numbers I've seen are in the upper 70s, lower 80s. It, it seems to vary a little bit. And I'm not sure what's going on with the new. There's a Delta subtype in Europe right now. that seems to have a slightly higher contagion uh, rate. So I don't think I can give you a solid answer. And then the second question, how do we get everybody to be vaccinated? Um, yeah, get, I have snarky answers. I don't have a really good answer. <laughs> You know, get everybody to care about everybody else, I guess would be my snarky answer. But um, I, we're, they're doing the best they can, I think. You know, the mandates are interesting. They'll face legal challenges and all of that. But it, it's just going to be an interesting period for the next few years, I think. That's probably true. I mean, I, I, we have the same discussions on campus uh, in Moed. I mean, the thing is, um, I think from our um, Employees side, we are at about 80%, 75, 80% or so, but the students are only at 30%, which is, of course, the, um, the concern because they intermix with each other. And, you know, you never know what the outbreak might be or if there's an outbreak at some point. And, of course, the, uh, you're right about the mandates. That probably doesn't fly very well. But what you can do is what Delta Airlines did, right? I mean, they put a $200 premium subcharge for those who are not vaccinated and maybe let's make some people think about that if right. any Dr. other Webb, argument doesn't work i know you have a previous engagement here in a few minutes so we don't want to keep you too long uh, there is one other question if you have a, another minute though uh, scott asks is natural immunity a real thing uh yeah natural immunity is a real thing because when you're infected with the virus your, your body will respond you will mount um and immune response. So yeah, it's going to happen. All right. Well, thank you so much. This is absolutely, fa I think I speak for everybody when I say this is absolutely fascinating and KES, we're trying to do our part to make the world a better place. <laughs> so, you know, hopefully we spread the good word and um, we really appreciate you being here and explaining this in a way that we can understand it. Even those of us who are not in the medical field. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure and best of luck to y'all. Thank you very much. You have a good one. All right, you too.